Okay. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you um, to welcome back to our attendees. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second webinar today and the sixth webinar in our series um, on teaching international law, where we'll be discussing critical perspectives on teaching of international law. Um, just a few reminders around logistics. The main one being that if you have any questions or comments, please do feel free to add those in the Q&A box. We are also able to promote people to be able to ask questions and um, live via audio and video. So if you are interested in that, please do drop a line in the Q&A box so that we know that we, we should be promoting you to do that. Um, other than that, uh, just another reminder that the recordings of these webinars are live online. So if you have missed some of the other webinars, you can catch up on those also on the um, webinar series webpage on the Bickel website. And the uh, recordings from today will be uploaded in the next few days. Um, with having said that, I pass on to Barry to introduce Gary. Great, thanks Jean-Pierre. Um, so for those of you just joining us, uh, my name is Barry Sander. I am an assistant professor at Leiden University and one of the co-conveners of this webinar series on teaching international law. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the chair of today's panel, uh, Professor Gary Simpson, who is the uh, chair in public international law at the London School of Economics. Um, and uh, Gary has taught all around the world. He spent time at the University of Melbourne, Australian National University, he's had visiting positions at NYU and Harvard. Um, his publication record is outstanding. Um, he's got incredible books such as Great Powers and Outlaw States, which I believe was an award-winning book. Um, he's also got one of my personal favorite books on law, war, and crime. Um, for those of us who work in the field of international criminal law, I think we all keep that book close to our, close to our hearts. Um, and it's a real privilege uh, to, to welcome you, uh, Gary. I, I should say uh, that uh, I first met uh, Gary in person when he was the external examiner uh, to my PhD. Spoiler alert, I passed, um, hence we're, you know, still friends. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, today uh, a bit of a different role. Um, and uh, welcome, Gary, welcome. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And, and let me just say what a terrific initiative this is of, of Jean-Pierre's and Barry's and, and Bickel. Um, I've always been interested in the teaching of international law. I wrote something on this years and years ago, in fact, and it's just great to see it given your know, proper attention um, through a series of panels, all of which look very, very interesting. I, I've, I've seen the first one, I'm planning to catch up on some of the others, but I'm particularly looking forward to our own panel, naturally on critical perspectives on the teaching of international law. We have a great panel. Everyone's going to speak for around, you know, 13 to 15 minutes. And then we'll open up as much time for, for questions and answers, both from the floor and amongst us here together. So we'll emphasize the conversational aspects of the, uh, of the panel. I'm not going to spend very long at all introducing people. And what I intend to do is just introduce the speakers who will speak and then they'll speak and then I'll introduce the next speaker. That's how I'm going to do it. Otherwise I'll spend an age going through our, 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 our panel. So the um, first two speakers speaking on a sort of, sort of um, joint paper, I presume Aoife and Henry uh, are Henry Jones and Aoife O'Donoghue at um, Durham University. Henry's an assistant professor of law at Durham. Uh, Aoife is professor of international law and global, global governance at the law school at Durham. Um, I've known and admired their work for a long time and it's good to have them speaking here on decolonization, anachronism, a big subject for international lawyers at the moment and the use of history, teaching the history of international law in interesting times, a nice um, Arantian title. So uh, Henry, you're kicking us off here, I think. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jerry. We're going to split the time in half between us, uh, hopefully. So I'll get started. This is a paper we've been working on for a couple of years. So it's just an attempt to sort of give a very quick run through of something that we're trying to finish off. Um, our paper's about the teaching of the history of international law 
starting with the question of how international law, to, law is taught, we focus on the history of international law as both a specific topic as well as an approach to understanding the nature of international law. We're particularly interested in whether our pedagogic goals are in line with our what our students want and need from us. We identify a gap between the state of scholarship in this area and the state of teaching as represented by leading textbooks. This is part of a broader concern for legal education. As teachers of law, we need to be confident we both cultivate humanity in Martha Nussbaum's term and also equip our students with the argumentative tools to engage in a world of social justice movements, culture wars, catastrophic climate change and grotesque inequality. This is the real political work of education not to indoctrinate, but to empower. The final section uh, offers alternative modes of teaching alongside personal reflections on our own pedagogical practice in teaching international law. What prompted us to start thinking seriously about this was the publication of an article in a leading journal which offered an historical argument which failed all the most fundamental standards of scholarship, defended ultimately by the editors on vague academic freedom grounds. That specific incident seems quite a long time ago now, and unfortunately feels like one of many, uh, but it set us to thinking about how the history of international law is taught. It's well known and widely celebrated that the last 20 or so years, that in the last 20 or so years, the history of international law has been the cutting edge research question. This doesn't show any sign of slowing. Critical histories, including feminist, Marxist, and most productively third world approaches to international law, have shed fresh light on the history of the discipline and its political frame. This work has illuminated contemporary international law in important ways that disrupt traditional academic narratives. But what effect has it had on the teaching of international law as evidenced in leading textbooks? International law does not occur in a void. Sorry, international legal education does not occur in a void. Both academics and students arrive with assumptions and preconceptions. Teaching international law should mean unpicking these notions. These presumptions often take four forms. First, fixed views about law, frequently based on students' knowledge of their domestic orders. Second, presumptions that international law is both neutral and ideology free. Third, incompat incompatible with the second, that international law is mostly about war in the United Nations and is infrequently followed. Fourth, students' views of their and their home country's place in the world, its relative power, its history as a colony or a colonizer, its role in various localized and global wars, their understanding of class and their place within it and the media they have watched. While we hopefully no longer need to justify the presence of international law on the curriculum, why an emphasis on history? In Matt Craven's words, international law is an historical perspective. It is an historical discourse. To make an international law argument is to make an argument about history. The story of uninterrupted progress towards a just global order and perpetual peace is the argument of a particular politics, theory, and context. <clears throat> Does it make sense in a contemporary context where our students are active in social movements, including Me Too, Black Lives Matter, climate strikes, and demanding that we decolonize the curriculum. What use to them is the myth of Westphalia. While the Me Too movement demands legal accountability, international law has only recently engaged with questions of sexual violence, and its history has often intentionally forgotten the contribution of women. Decolonizing the curriculum should be an easy sell for the history of international law, putting colonialism and empire at the heart of the subject and understanding the grip that this history has on the presence of international law. Finally, I want to know how we can teach the Lake Lanou arbitration to a generation of climate striking school children and keep a straight face. At this point, I'm gonna hand over to Aoife. Thank you, Henry. Um, so from, from taking that, we, um, as part of the methodology, we looked at textbooks and processes of teaching and what should inform or what we, you know, the research says we should inform how we go about structuring, how we go about teaching and how we use textbooks and, and broader reading. And we thought one of the things in practice that we should do is, is explain to our students why history is important in international legal context, to be very clear and upfront to the students 
why history is there, why it's necessary for them to understand it, and as Henry has already outlined, their place within that history. Um, we also considered that, as, as part of that, we also need to talk to them about ethics. Okay, so we need to talk to them about the ethics involved in practicing, reading, writing, thinking about international law. Particularly if we look at, uh, for instance, the way that um, uh, the way we present those who write international law, who act in international law. So in, in looking at that, we then looked at, at the textbooks and what they meant. Now, there are, as we know in the scholarship, there's been a proliferation of histories. Henry's already talked about, there's no histories of the histories, and I'm involved in that myself. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of that has not reached the textbooks. The textbooks have not really engaged with the wealth and depth of historical scholarship that is there. Um, it, it hasn't appeared. And what we did was decided we would look at textbooks uh, across, now they, all the textbooks we looked at were in English um, and they were all published by the major um, publishing houses in law and international law, just to put a caveat there. But as, as we've seen actually in the, in the other sessions um, um, that have been run the last few months, and, um, the use of these textbooks is global. Um, obviously, work by people like Anthea Roberts is important here as well, and De La Rizla and Schwabel Patel, you know, they've all written uh, about these issues as well, and we've, we've, we've looked and built on their work. So we surveyed the textbooks and we were asking, we asked three questions. Um, what was the use of peri periodization in those textbooks? You know, how, how did they divide up time? Did they divide up time? And what ways did they do that? What aspects of history were covered? And then who is cited and who is remembered? So who, who, who are brought forth as the figures of the history of international law? Now, in looking at the periodization, and particularly the work of Della Rizal, that was really important there. And, and you know, the idea of you know, the history uh, periodization through the hegemon, and that, that's quite common. So who are you know, looking at, you know, whether it's Portuguese and the Spanish or are looking to um, uh, French and, and British imperialism, looking at who, who, and in the current area of the US hegemony, Soviet hegemony. So that, that, is a, that, that, that was quite a common one. And um, there was also the Eurocentric universalization of the history. So the European history of international became the global um, state-centered one. So that's the one that the kind of Westphalia version of, of history, um, a kind of idealistic uh, intellectual, so the kind of the history of the profession as the history, um, and then the sort of an institutional version of the history, so you focus on the bodies, um, and then kind of a normative version of the history. And now not, most textbooks mixed those, so there, there wasn't a sort of a kind of one version that any of the particular textbooks filled. And as part of that, of course, some of them devoted pages and pages, Others devoted one page, half a page, and sometimes actually the people who devoted half a page sometimes did it better because they were saying there is lots of this research. Go read these things. There's lots there. The second was we looked at the indexes in the text to see when were words. Uh, we picked three: so imperialism, um, post-colonialism, or, or colonization, and decolonization and colonization to see how often they were mentioned. And it, I mean, I think I was quite surprised myself, even though I've used all of these books for years. But they're hardly mentioned at all, even though these are actually huge movements. They're, they're so, so, and I'm being very general here. There were people within there, there were books within these contexts that did mention these things, but most often it was rare, most often it was in passing. Um, and then looking at the, we moved on to look to the citations, and most of the citations were of white European men. And I think that's where the gulf was um, clearest between the state of the scholarship and the research that's been done, particularly over the last 20, 30 years, and what's appearing in the textbooks. And there was this, this stuff. Now, our work here, you know, it's not a conclusive, as I say, we were restricted in the books that we looked, looked at. Um, but that, that, was a, that was clear, really. Now, now different textbooks be, were better than others. If we take that as a measure of better or worse, there were some that were more useful in that context than others. Um, so then we thought, well, what if we were doing it differently? What would we do? And we would include those three questions. So, you know, talking to the students and explaining in the textbooks why the history is important, you know, building on, on Jerry's work and Matt's work, you know, explain to them why it's important, why it's important as a method. 
talking to them about the ethics, you know, talking to them about the fact that uh, our predecessors in the profession buttressed racism, buttressed colonialism, supported misogyny, supported slavery, and how much international law contributed to that system. And saying, how do we avoid, you know, considering how do we avoid validating th those actions of those figures and asking the students then to question their own role, if their future role and their present role, and those of the scholars at present. Um, and then looking at, at who, and considering who we look at and who they are in the room. What are their histories? What are the relevancies to them? And I look at um, the great book, um, student book that came out, the students here you know, taking command of the situation themselves, um, uh, on uh, the Black Girls Manifesto in particular, I think it's been particularly excellent on this, are taking up space. And the impact on their personal education of the fact that their history and the history of who they were was seen as irrelevant to the curriculums they were being taught. That, who, that, that they were seen as add-ons and not part of the discourse and that the curriculum was not talking to them or their experiences. Very briefly, and as a model that we took up in, in actually teaching, and we do teach international legal history as a separate, a separate module, but within the basic undergraduate public international law course, what we took was uh, looking at Versailles. So we started with Versailles, and as part of that, we read out bits of the treaty and the League of, um, and the Covenant for the League. And that was actually quite uncomfortable. If you're reading it out loud, especially the bit about mandates and civilization, and you're reading that out loud to students, that's uncomfortable and it should be uncomfortable. But as part of, of talking to students about that, we also focused on the role of women in the um, coming up to the Treaty of Versailles in the League and campaigning to make sure that women could become civil servants as part of of the League of Nations when it became operational. And in doing that, using that to go backwards to explaining why women had to do that, why the mandate system was necessary, and then moving forward from that moment, saying what happened afterwards. So in just picking a different moment, we did cover all the things that, you know, somebody could argue you have to cover in history topic, but by decentering what's normally there, you got to ask a different question. Now, these weren't perfect. This wasn't a brilliant lecture by any stretch, but it was a way of, of trying to put into practice what we were talking about. And in, in furthering along of that, myself and, and Henry, together with another colleague, Dr. Ruth Houghton, who's at Newcastle University, were at the very beginnings of working with Bristol University Press as part of their Diverse Voices in Law series of doing uh, an not quite an international law textbook, but a, a text alongside textbooks. And as part of that, we're reflecting on the work we've done here and how we can use history in a way in a book that's intended to focus to students and talk to students and do it perhaps try to try to build on the lessons that we're working on within this article i'll finish there yeah terrific thank you both um lots of questions arising from that we'll just we'll just hold on to those while we move through the panel. We'll have a discussion um, afterwards. Um, Khadija Magoop is speaking next. I have actually never met you. I'm sorry we're not in person, um, but it's great to have you here. She's an assistant professor uh, of international law, the Faculty of Law, University of Khartoum. Uh, she's also written on the rights of the child relatively recently, and her um, talk today is called Cultural Interactions with the Pedagogy of International Law, Possible Opportunities and challenges, thanks. Thank you for that introduction, Jerry. Um, hello everyone. My name is Khadija Sheikh Mahjoub and in today's discussion, I'll be unpacking and examining cultural interactions with the pedagogy of international law. May I just share my slides, please, first? <laughs> Thank you. Naturally, our first question might may be, what is culture? The definition of culture 
is not a straightforward one. However, one way of approaching it is to consider the context in which the definition is needed. In this respect, and for the sake of the discussion today, I would say that the most relevant definition is the one in the preamble of the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity. In particular, it is the understanding that culture is the emotional features of the society that is of greater relevance to my presentation today. When it comes to culture and its interaction with international law, it is rooted, it is rooted sorry, in its very nature as a set of regulations concerned with the rights and duties of its concerned subjects. Cultural interactions and debates are very much in the center of a number of fields. Here are just a few notable ones, such as the international human rights ones, international human rights law ones, which, which is full of discussion on universalism, cultural relativism, margin of appreciation, all our cultural talk. Other ones also include discussions on the history of international law or the sources of international law. And arguable, arguably, less discussed ones are the ones on international arbitration, for example but they are all concerned with culture and international law. The richness in the topic of culture and international law represents itself in the availability of a number of higher education models and courses which address the subject. Next, we must ask how would the teaching and learning process of such a heavily culturally related topic be brought into the learning environment? The teaching of international law is, under, un, is in undergraduate law schools varies in relation to its placement in the curriculum as a mandatory or an elective course. This is something that needs to be taken into consideration. However, in most instances, shared learning outcomes of all is arguably available. That is, the students understand the rules governing the international actions of international subjects within an international community. The constructive alignment with such learning outcomes requires the curriculum, teaching strategies, and assessments working in a symbiotic relationship to achieve such learning outcomes. While the interaction of culture and pedagogy is not a new topic, the issue that needs meticulous handling when it comes to the teaching international, the issue needs meticulous handling when it comes to the, to the issue of teaching international law. This, this is for many reasons, one of which is obviously the culturally heated nature of the topics themselves. One challenge against such culturally heated topic lies within the cultural perception of international rules and regulations amongst the students. It would be best to recall here the UNESCO definition, which refers to the emotional features of the society or a social group. Emotional features of, of the society and social group, i.e. the students in this context. In this respect, I suggest the following learning environments. The first one is a multi-diverse learning environment. The second one is a moderately diverse learning environment. For example, there are variations of gender only, for example. And the third one is a non-diverse learning environment where no, which, which features no diversity, uh, diversity at all, such as culture or gender, they are not present at all. Speaking of the learning outcomes, all three environments are expected to learn the rules and regulations of international law in relation to their international dimension, dimensions also known as the international community, obviously, of subjects. However, the question that remains as to how to achieve this when considering the culturally provocative nature of the topics and emotional culture facets of the, of the students' backgrounds. Initially, initially, despite the colorfully diverse composition of the learning environments, it is expected that all the students will, as, as a start, apply a cultural lens 
when understanding and learning the norms. By this, we mean that what has been referred to by some scholars as a form of representation where a student would internalize the international norms and rules being learned in a manner nearer to their own cultural precepts. This fosters a sense of belonging, bringing in the concept in an understandable format, bringing in the international rule, the international concept in an understandable format that I can harmonize with my own way of thinking and then I will accept it. Despite all this, we, we run the risk of students in many instances applying their own cultural lens and remaining unaccepting of certain norms. Take for instance, an undergraduate public international law module discussing the historical background or evolution of the field. What makes a great difference in the previously mentioned three learning environment scenarios, the discussion surrounding the history and creation of international law. Who is the father of international law? Is it Abul Hassan al-Shaybani or is it Hyogo Grotius? Students in all three environments will apply their cultural lens. However, the teaching and learning process at play should bear a great responsibility in supporting students to overcome any divisional cultural background. For the most part of it, focus on the idea that what matters today are the rules themselves and the value they add to the contemporary international law community. The linchpin of the teaching and learning process in the role, is the role played by the law professor. After all, they, after all, they utilize their own cultural lens as well, but they need to recognize this first and work and work on what has been rightly termed as their cultural proficiency. What is cultural proficiency? proficiency? It, is, it denotes an inside out approach that if adopted can guide and empower a law professor to examine her own cultural background, privileges and assumptions, dismantle her biases and improve the quality of her teaching and student interactions. Law professors are to are there to manage the teaching and learning process in a way that would support the expected learning outcomes. In this respect, and from my own experience, I found the following practices to be helpful in achieving the learning outcomes and managing such a culturally contentious environment. First, it is important to work towards achieving a sense of belonging among students, particularly when the cultural background of students leans more towards them and us or us and them scenario. Number two, speaking to students about the international community. We are all in this together despite need for, despite some need for reform. We, all, we are all aware of this, but we are, still we are all in this together. Teaching and assessment activities should be geared towards opening dialogues and conversations. Teaching and learning research suggests that students take an, a, a proactive role in their learning translating this to, to the learning environment, requirements of dialogue demands that students are placed in a position where they are expected to argue against their own personal convictions. I am aware that, that some might argue against this approach by asking whether it is possible to speak of an international community, considering the cultural biases in some international law rules, norms and regulations. While agreeing with some of these arguments, I am very much conscious that the teaching and learning of international law should not deviate from the main objectives, that there is an international community that has a vested collective interest in being regulated by international norms. Climate change, for instance, it is, shared, it is a shared topic that universally affects the international community and requires collective handling. The issue of the relationship between culture and pedagogy of international law cannot obviously be sufficiently covered in 10 minutes. <laughs> and my, my talk today is, is a contribution to the ongoing academic dialogue. As such, I have noted some recommendations. Fur first, further research and discussions on the interaction of culture with the pedagogy of international law at both local international levels 
I would also like to recommend, recommend the consideration of an international principles or declaration instrument, specially tailored for the teaching of international law. These recommendations aim to support the principle that quality teaching of international law requires everyone involved to work towards a feeling of belonging within an international community and that any much needed reforms or emancipation should happen within this context. Finally, a critical approach is one that obliges us to shed our blind spots and deal with others in a human and considerate manner in the world we all share. These three assets, a multicultural world, a, a multicultural world, a, a multicultural international community and a shared sense of belonging. They are all three, three assets that we all share. They are, they are an invaluable tool for the international law community. With these, we increase inclusivity, increase awareness of the international rules we are, we are bound by and strengthen the power of international law. Thank you for listening. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, the Institute and the organizing committee uh, of the webinar. And I also have special thanks to Dr. Jean-Pierre and Dr. Barry Sanders. Thank you all. Great, well, thank you for speaking. Um, we look forward to taking questions on that subject. Um, so uh, Nicola, uh, you're up next. Uh, Nicola is a, a sort of neighbor of mine at King's College and is a senior lecturer in criminal law there. She's the author of Courts in Conflict, Interpreting the Layers of Justice in Post-Genocide Rwanda. And her topic today is teaching transnational and international criminal law as a critical project. Thanks, Nicola. Great, thanks, Gary. And um, just really nice to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from Kigali, so I'm not only writing on post genocide justice. So we've lost Nicola. Just in Rwanda, oh. I've currently been watching the um, in the capital. So, um, so all seem, seem quite timely. So, from this vantage point here, the the courts in Rwanda that have been designed and funded to prosecute genocide are now adjudicating. And and please do let me know if the if the connection doesn't hold, and I'll, I'll see if I can find another option. Um, but the, these courts that have been set up and funded to prosecute genocide are, are adjudicating predominantly cases of bribery, terrorism, money laundering, and human trafficking. Um, in the UK, leading barristers with careers built in international criminal courts have spearheaded the domestic prosecution of modern slavery. While, specialists, while the specialist chamber in Kosovo funded to try war crimes and crimes against humanity has a caseload weighted towards trafficking in human organs. Once international criminal law is renationalized, the institutions and personnel focused on adjudicating what are commonly called the core crimes of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity appear to be pivoting towards addressing what scholars like Neil Boyster would term transnational crimes. International and transnational criminal law are not as neatly separated as the current scholarship presents them and can, in my view, be constructively taught together. So in contributing to this broader discussion on teaching international law, I want to make two proposals. First, that in bringing ICL and TCL, international criminal law and transnational criminal law, into the same pedagogical frame, prompts a new reckoning with critical legal education and the ambivalent role of law in mediating the tensions between individual agency and the wider social and material structures that shape that agency. Second, contributing uh, combining TCL and ICL opens up the possibility of inquiry-based learning that takes seriously the standpoints of the students in our classrooms while enabling those students to engage with a wider understanding of the use of penal power in public international law 
as a form of global governance. And I think this speaks to the, the two previous um, papers as well. So let me just set the scene. In September 2013, I co-taught a course entitled Transnational Criminal Law with my wonderful King's colleague, um, Professor Prabha Katisran at the Center for Transnational Legal Studies, which was a collaborative teaching environment of staff and students from 24 law schools around the world. The center is based in London and has been led by the Georgetown University since, 20, since 2008. From 2014, we then taught a revised version of this course, now entitled Transnational and International Criminal Law, as part of the King's LLM under the aegis of the Transnational Law Institute. Initially, the first half of the module focused on international crimes and the second on transnational. It was only in 2018 that now teaching it on my own as Prabha moved to leading her important social reproduction project, I restructured the course to enable a weekly shift between international and transnational crimes. For example, we started with, the, with crimes against humanity, then moved to discussion of the early conceptions of the enemy of humanity, that of the pirate. In both, session, in both of those sessions, we focused on the Kenyan context to see what these legal cases, both of ICL and TCL, illuminate. We'll just be patient for a second, I think, because Nicola came back in last time. So just let, let's just give her a-, a, a Did a it enables? Sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you sort of cut out a bit in the last couple of minutes, but before that, it was quite clear. So, so keep going. Okay, let me, so what I, what I wanted to say here was that bringing these together demands and enables a re-engagement with critical pedagogies and inquiry-based learning. So in building this argument, I think it's important for all of us here to recognize that legal doctrine is uncomfortably well-suited to didactic styles of teaching. In the traditional structure of law school tuition, students need to know the specific Legal principles established in particular legislation or treaties, the practical scenarios presented to the students who then, who then apply them to a particular set of facts. Now critical comment can of course be encouraged, but such comment in the criminal law more specifically is generally focused on how the law may deviate from the theoretical principles of autonomy, rationality and certainty that it claims to espouse. Now, as Gary alerted to us in his early critical take on teaching public international law on the magic mountain, the teaching of international law is actually particularly well placed to start to interrogate foundational theoretical assumptions, including those um, that abound in the domestic teaching of criminal law. It was from as early as, as 1982 that Duncan Kennedy argued that these core lawyering skills that, that we're equipping our students with are often taught in an opaque and mystifying fashion that is about that is as much about reinforcing hierarchies of knowledge and positions of domination and subordination in the law school and the legal profession than it is about the more idealized goals of education and law as vehicles for emancipation. Kennedy, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, argued that the experience of traditional legal education is one of double surrender to a pacifying classroom experience and to a passive attitude towards the content of the legal system. This surrender is reinforced through an artificial construction of a highly competitive environment where students are continually measured against their peers and against the demands of the legal profession and intentionally and consistently found wanting. We only have to look at the anxiety levels among our students as to the grades that, that we are getting, that they are getting, to see that in the dire context of the increasing marketization of higher education in the UK and its resultant rely on, reliance on precarious labor and the student as client, 
that Kennedy's critique continues to find resonance, but it also offers less guidance on a possible solution. He concludes that seminal article stating that what is needed is to think about law in a way that will allow students to enter into it, to criticize without utterly rejecting it, and to manipulate it without self-abandonment to an alien system of thinking and doing. This clarion call is undoubtedly appealing, but remarkably hard to realize. In revisiting Kennedy's critique in 2014, Nicola Lacey remarked that at an everyday level, inside and outside of the classroom, all that one can more or less do is to be honest and reflexive about the contradictions. In part, it's in pursuit of such reflexivity that, prob that prompted the writing of this paper. Yet before resigning myself to a permanent, albeit very productive cycle of self-critique, I want to explore whether the new pedagogical space that's being prized open by the realities of globalization and touted under this banner of transnational law may offer a new way to enter into teaching critical legal scholarship because it demands and makes visible the tensions that animate the role of lawyers under conditions of liberal capitalism. Many of the core tensions in criminal law that critical legal scholarship has long endeavored to illuminate are more immediately visible when examined at the extreme in the context of mass atrocity and the extended networks of criminality that map onto wide and rapid movements of peoples, goods, and capital that have given rise to international and transnational criminal law. For example, the legal response in defining rape and the possibilities of stark relief, the embedded tensions in individual criminal culpability between autonomous choice on the one hand and the realization of victims' rights and the teleological claims of, end, of ending impunity. Yet, they're less easily reconciled with the traditional liberal constraints on the reach of criminal law. Now, much of the response in ICL has been to try to strengthen these liberal ties. Yet, the introduction of transnational crimes takes us in a different direction. The emerging debates on the relationship between criminal law and other forms of regulatory governance are more readily discussed in transnational crime. The critique of human traffic rather than the criminal response to the drug trade. In TCL, criminal law more readily emerges as one possible response among many. This is an insight that I said, particularly as we become criminal law, developed through public international law and then renationalized around the world. In this way, the practice and scholarship in the transnational legal environment opens up a set of questions about how the indeterminacy at the core of legal argument deliberately obscures and mediates social tensions. Criminal law is at the hard edge of these discussions around tensions between individual autonomy, state authority and international and international laws notions of sovereignty. However, while recognizing this potential, the question as to what teaching methods can be deployed to enable student participation in this learning remains open. Luis Islava has recently pointed out how an increasingly global classroom offers an opportunity to pay attention to the specificities of learners' socioeconomic, geographic, and cultural backgrounds, because these standpoints inform and shape their sense of agency, and hence the nature of their interaction with the world. Coupled with a historical and contextual sensitivity, this recognition of standpoint then enables us that enables the students to link their particular position to wider discussions on the structure, shape, rules, and constraints on that agency. And this aligns in terms of the educational literature with Sprock and Smith and Walker's work on inquiry-based learning. And I think it's in fostering the students' capacity to develop their own research agenda 
that offers an engaged way forward for teaching international law. So in my own experience, the greatest strength of, of the course that we've been wrestling with, and, and you know, as we've said, this is not perfect by any means, the greatest strength of the course is found in its research, research teaching nexus. The course assessment is based on an extended essay, the subject of which is decided in conversation with the students. And so to conclude, I want to highlight some of the examples of the research papers that have emerged from this course. Um, on the students initiative. So over the last four years, we've had students examine the extent to which ISIS fighters under the age of 18 should be considered child soldiers, what the opioid addiction in the US tells us about the capacity of international law to regulate licit and illicit sale of drugs, the rapid rise, of, uh, the rapid the rise and risks of a victim-centered international criminal justice system, a feminist critique of rape law in China, but also the areas that challenge my own unstated normative com commitments, such such as a Sharia-informed justification for the use of the death penalty for international crimes. What I think this shows is that rather than a resignation to the failures and recurrent critique of the crisis facing international criminal justice, once transnational criminal law is brought into the frame, we start to understand, critique, and engage with how criminal law is being deployed to govern inside states and between them. Thanks, everyone. Great, thank you, Nicola. Um, some tantalizing ellipses from, uh, from Kigali there, but I think we managed to fill in the, uh, the very, very infrequent gaps. So, so thanks for that paper. Look forward to taking it up in discussion. Um, we now turn to Philip Kastner. It's good to see you, Philip, again. Um, I hope the international criminal law community in, in Australia is, is, is thriving. Um, Philip uh, recently published a very impressive um, edited volume that I was lucky enough to be part of. I think that's a couple of years ago now, isn't it? Uh, he's a senior lecturer at the Law School of University of Western Australia, and his topic Today is teaching international criminal law, decentering the law and the teacher. Philip, take it away. Thank you for this kind introduction. I'll start by picking up just on this uh, very uh, important gap, I think that uh, Henry and Eiffe uh, identified with respect to the history of international law, this gap in the, between, between the scholarship, between the critical scholarship and the teaching. And I've also identified this, I think, um, in the context of international criminal law. So this is what I will be focusing on today. But I think this is perhaps a trend or a theme that, that is really uh, much more important uh, than, than we uh, might actually think of when we focus on our particular interests. Um, and it is clear to me that the, the scholarship on international criminal law has really become increasingly critical, increasingly self-reflective. Uh, in recent years, um, but the teaching has not necessarily uh, picked up on that. And so I try to incorporate really this critical turn into my teaching. And my paper and also in my presentation today, what I want to focus on uh, today are aspects of my teaching that are inspired by critical pedagogy and that consist in decentering both the law and the teacher. In other words, uh, myself pretty much. And this is really based on the argument that trying to be a critical scholar and a critical teacher and to encourage critical thinking among students actually really requires such a decentering of the teacher. And there are really interesting links, I think, between uh, what we teach and what we learn between the substance, whatever the, whatever the field is, um, and uh, the, the substantive critique of a particular field. So again, I will be focusing on international criminal law, but I think that could be applied really to, to any uh, to any topic really, to any field, a uh, link between what is learned, what is taught, and the way in which we teach and learn about it. Now, just to briefly situate myself and my teaching and the experiences um, that I'm drawing on, I draw primarily on my experience of teaching international criminal law at the University of Western Australia since 2015. I've also taught this course once as a visitor at the University of Vienna. I've been teaching this course in the form of a fairly small graduate seminar. So just a wonderful format. Uh, I think it's really uh, great uh, um, as part of a master of international law program. Usually it's face-to-face -face, uh, with an important online component uh, 
to get ready for uh, uh, an intensive period, for the intensive period, because uh, usually I teach this as, a, as an intensive. It was taught on the uh, last year fully online uh, for quite obvious reasons. Um, there is a wonderful uh, diversity among the students. I won't go into the details in the way in which uh, Khadisha talks about diversity, uh, but uh, there is a lot, uh, I think, that is, that is really uh, interesting and relevant, both in terms of uh, origin, also in terms of educational background. So some of the students have a law degree, others have a BA in political science, international relations, uh, history, etc., which can be uh, quite challenging in some ways, uh, but also a great opportunity really to be, um, to be serious about the benefits of learning together. Just a few words about uh, critical pedagogy. Obviously, I draw on thinkers uh, like the big, uh, the big names like Paulo Freire and Henri Giroux, uh, but I will really try to focus on and discuss what I, what I take from these authors and their suggestions. Also keeping in mind that the meaning of critical pedagogy is not determined or a fixed approach. Um, so I will also highlight the way in which I try to put into practice these general insights about the pedagogy in this uh, particular context in, in my course on international criminal law. So I hope that I will actually be able to respond to one of the questions that were already posted in the forum uh, with respect to specific examples of pursuing critical pedagogies in the classroom. Now, the first important point I want to raise is that learning and teaching are relational. Knowledge can only emerge through dialogue, as Paulo Freire said, and everything, including education, including pedagogy, and also knowledge is political. Uh, knowledge is, in fact, a social construction deeply rooted in a nexus of power relations. Uh, these are the words of Peter McLaren. Now, in my teaching, what this means, I try to translate this into my teaching is that I really try to foster horizontal relationships that are based on mutual trust, on support, solidarity, on an ethics of care, um, with respect and caring being the foundation, of course, but clearly not the ultimate goal of critical pedagogy. Um, I try to create a learning space that is not competitive, but collaborative and that facilitates these really important open-minded encounters. Now, more specifically what this means, and uh, this, this might sound very familiar, um, I think to those who try to engage you know, in a teaching style that is not based on straight lectures, as well that I uh, you know, uh, conduct and, and, and suggest uh, group exercises. The students uh, uh, also comment on each other's research paper proposals, so there's peer feedback, the idea is clearly that the students learn together, that they learn from each other. Um, to prepare, to get ready for the intensive period, everyone completes sort of a short, fairly simple introductory quiz where everyone, including myself also, introduces, uh, introduces themselves. And uh, this also helps uh, create, think a group feeling and also already sets off a conversation about issues that the students are uh, particularly interested in, even before the start of the actual classroom experience uh, during the intensive period. Now, just to turn to uh, the international committee law element, really, and I try to link it uh, again to the substance. Now, this approach is clearly reflected in the substance. So the topics that we address in the course of the seminar and also the approaches that we consider. Now, just very briefly, um, and I think after the uh, previous presentations, uh, I don't need too much of a justification here, uh, fortunately, why I think that the political, the cultural, the historical aspects of international criminal law, they all matter. Questions of power obviously are really important. Um, and so I try to, to really cover those and address those and make the students uh, reflect on these aspects. Uh, also to consider international criminal law as part of a larger discourse on, trans tra on of, uh, transitional justice. And so I adopt what I call a contextual perspective. I've, I really try to foreground what would often be considered mere background and largely beyond the scope of analysis. I suggest approaching international criminal law, its substance, the procedures, the objectives, the justifications, the impacts, pretty much everything really, I think that you could uh, think of. I uh, suggest understanding these through a contextual perspective that to some extent at least also actually decenters the law. Um, so it's really beyond trying to consider international criminal law beyond kind of these uh, core crimes or beyond international criminal law in the, in the, in the, in the narrow sense. 
uh, just very briefly, I think that that uh, the the collective and underlying dimensions of violence, uh, for instance, are not really captured by the current definitions of international crimes, by the current definitions, or by the, the by the dominant modes of accountability. Um, uh, Nicholas talked uh, talked uh, talked about the transnational crimes. Uh, which is, I think, uh, also a really important uh, lens, so I bring in those as well. Um, and economic crimes, for instance, and other forms of violence are typically ignored kind of in the more specific uh, international criminal law frame. Um, uh, so we also consider, uh, at least briefly, you know, the, the, the kind of structural dimensions, the historical colonial forms of violence, including ongoing forms of colonialism. But this really helps reveal many of the blind spots of the field and I think allows exploring some of its inherent biases, the hegemonic tendencies and power relations. And this approach critiques and perhaps even stands in opposition to uh, one of the underlying tenets of the dominant liberal or neoliberal paradigm and also of international criminal law, where I think it's quite clear that it's the individual in the form of the individual perpetrator um, that is seen as uh, the, uh, that is the focus and that is seen you know, as an autonomous, fully rational agent, uh, which is, I think, quite nicely illustrated by the complicated case and by the recent conviction before the International Criminal Court of Dominic Ongwen, the child soldier turned rebel leader. The second point I want to, uh, I want to uh, focus on uh, uh, consists in de-emphasizing presumably authoritative voices. Again, a theme I think that has already been mentioned in the previous presentations uh, in, in different ways. It is related to the critique of this, what I think is still a dominant uh, top-down approach uh, in international criminal law embodied clearly by the International Criminal Court, arguably also arguably by leading scholars who typically work in universities in the global north. Although the, the International Criminal Court has been heavily criticized, is arguably in crisis, uh, has been in crisis for years now. Um, the field is, I think, still extremely Eurocentric, even Hague-centric. Uh, we're, we're making huge efforts really to try to fix the, the International Criminal Court uh, amongst others, uh, which ignores, I think, or even silences other avenues to deal with serious crimes. Instead of emphasizing uh, the presumably authoritative voices, like decisions of international criminal tribunals, I seek to expose students really to a variety of voices, and especially to those that are usually marginal or marginalized, including their own, actually. Um, and uh, while Gary mentioned uh, the handbook that I've uh, edited, and I, um, well, I've written about this, so I won't say too much about this here, but the idea, one of the main ideas uh, behind this handbook really was also to include a variety of voices and not to have this kind of single author textbook, uh, which you know, can be well done. Uh, but I think it's, it's uh, at least, uh, you know, when you have a, a variety of contributors and, and read a variety of authors, that's just um, beneficial by itself. With respect to the topics covered, uh, for instance, just to take one very briefly, uh, take one example, we discussed, for instance, the experience and relevance of non-official institutions like people's or citizens' tribunals, and so not you know, institutional context, not only kind of the official courts. Um, this is also related, I think, to that critique um, that we often work in silos and that international criminal law only requires sort of specific technical legal expertise to end impunity for the world's crimes. Um, now, I'd just like to make an important caveat here that of course we need technical knowledge and understand the currently existing legal frameworks, but students and I think like everyone else must really be prepared to think critically um, and uh, what Henry Giroux uh, has, uh, how he has framed it, um, to act in a socially responsible way and to make moral judgments. Again, going back to the teaching more specifically, um, really pedagogy also is not just a skill or a technique. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind. It's, it, it is often uh, perceived as such, like how do you actually, um, you know, apply specific, specific or implement specific, uh, specific methods really. And I think it's important to, to uh, be aware of this dimension as well. Um, now, in addition to suggesting a variety of uh, readings that, that reflect different voices and drawn critical theories, including feminist and post-colonial approaches, uh, 
according to which uh, I think important to recall, knowledge continues to be controlled by certain hegemonic actors. I, I really try to translate also these theoretical insights into my teaching practice. Now, what this means still more uh, specifically is that in line with a, this dialogic approach, students are invited to take the lead in exploring both individually and in groups uh, the materials. Uh, for instance, each student becomes a what I kind of see as a guest lecturer or uh, as a facilitator of each topic. Each student prepares a presentation, is responsible for facilitating the ensuing class discussion. Uh, the idea is really then to engage in dialogue, to question knowledge and, and so on and so forth. Now, clearly I'm aware of the fact that I do suggest topics. I provide guidance on the readings with critical pedagogy, importantly, not being non-directive or neutral. Um, but the students can always focus on issues that are of particular interest to them, amongst others by choosing the specific topics of their presentations and uh, also of their final research papers. So there's also an important uh, research teaching nexus, I think, because I focus a lot on the, uh, on the research component, as Nicola mentioned. Uh, um, I also try to be aware of and not perpetuate common power dynamics. Um, so I try to be aware of this uh, dimension that I, that I should not assume that only because I think that I've created a space where everyone can participate, sort of a Habermasian ideal speech situation, that everyone can actually participate. Um, it is obvious that I think already confident students will uh, benefit most from open class discussions. So I do sometimes, you know, intervene and structure the discussion and, and, and seek to create genuine opportunities for everyone to participate. Um, and, and that can also be, uh, for instance, on the class website, um, where students, especially those that are less confident to speak in class, can post comments and questions. And um, I still, you know, try to uh, facilitate that and make it possible in the classroom. Um, but I found really the class website, the blogs there, a, actually a useful, a useful um, complementary site. Moreover, I really try to encourage relational learning. Um, and just a, a note on the, on the critical thinking skills that are typically part of the learning objectives of a university course, um, I think. And these critical thinking skills are in a way often, um, in fact, modeled, I think, on the, on the liberal kind of enlightened, rational, autonomously thinking subject, uh, which, that in turn is based on binary thinking, on a separation of the mind and the body, of theory and practice, uh, often also discourses of uttering, um, sort of in the spirit of basically colonial capitalism and, and nowadays neo-colonial and neoliberal thinking. So I, I, I try to, uh, to do justice to the idea that uh, the dialogue as Paulo Freire has written is not just a technique, uh, again, um, not just a tactic of education, but a way of knowing try to respect students' autonomy, to value their backgrounds and experiences. Once again, I often still feel the need to intervene to direct the dialogical learning experience, in particular, of course, to correct sort of what I see as, you know, sometimes there are errors, sometimes they just make mistakes, get something wrong in a way. Sometimes I, I, I clearly feel that I want to point myself, I want to point out issues that I consider important, that I try to transform to empower according to, you know, kind of my own convictions. Um, which is arguably an inherent contradiction and an inherent contradiction that is um, in fact already present in Freire's thought. Um, altogether, I, I still think that I, it's okay what I'm doing. It's, it's fine that I do that, but it's I think important to be at least aware of these dynamics and to, to uh, acknowledge that teaching is always directive to some extent that it is in fact never neutral. And that's really in line also with you know, the insights from critical pedagogy. Um, personal experience um, that I try to respect and you know and 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 uh, consider important uh, personal experience of the students well it's, it's not equivalent to knowledge and uh, kind of to be celebrated uncritically or to be taken as representative of a culture or a local context um, and it, it can and should I think always also be subject to critique um, I still do want to uh, I still want to uh, and do encourage students uh, to situate themselves, to be aware of their own backgrounds and potential biases. It clearly matters who we are, what our background is, 
Um, this uh, obviously uh, becomes uh, very, uh, very clear in the context of certain discussions. Think of the role of the International Criminal Court in Africa, for instance, when there are several students from African countries in the room. Uh, well, very often they have different perspectives on such issues than students who grew up and were educated primarily in Western Australia. Uh, once again, brief disclaimer here, I'm really not trying to establish sort of neat categories uh, here or assuming that, you know, every student has sort of a single, single reality or kind of a specific frame. There is, of course, great variety in your respective voices. The important point I'm just trying to make is that, that the background uh, clearly matters. I will conclude just with a few uh, general challenges, with a few thoughts about general challenges uh, to creating the pedagogical conditions that seek to decenter both the law and the teacher. They're clearly, and that, you know, that's not, uh, not telling you anything new here, I think, but there are well entrenched patriarchal assumptions in the mainstream market driven higher education, including among students. Um, they are not necessarily, um, you know, the very radical thinkers, I think, or radi radical beings. Um, as we all know, there is a tendency to commodify learning and knowing in a context where at least some tuition paying student consumers basically um, expect to receive education. Um, this I think also means that many students whether consciously or unconsciously are not necessarily interested in contributing to addressing existing inequalities to transforming the current socio-political and legal frameworks. I'm not blaming them uh, or blaming any specific students, I think, uh, or, or, or assuming uh, uh, anything uh, specific really. Uh, but I think that's just, a, that's just a reality. This is the environment really in which we, uh, in which we work and which we learn and teach. Um, to uh, 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 just uh, take uh, my university, the University of Western Australia as an example, I think it's a great university and uh, there's a lot of freedom. Nobody has told me specifically what I should and what I should not do in my teaching for instance, which is just fantastic, really. Uh, but it is still clearly, like the university is still clearly part of this dominant model. It's not an institution, obviously, that would easily facilitate sort of popular education in the, in the Farian sense. Um, so this environment, the, the kinds of students that are enrolled, the, the need for certain types of assessment, et cetera, et cetera, well, this clearly influences what, what, can, we, what can be done in our teaching. Um, and the last point I want to make is that trying to teach and learn many things and various aspects at the same time. And I, I, I really try, if you, you know, if you try to cover the political and cultural and historical dimensions and, you know, get the core crimes right, but also consider transnational crimes and the transitional justice discourses and so on and so forth. Well, I, I try to do a lot. I'm, I'm aware of this and this, this can be very challenging. Um, but I, I would argue that and, and I think it's it's more difficult than to kind of simply learning um, the law if that can ever exist. Um, and once again, I obviously want my students to understand that as well. Um, I want them to get that right and 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 to, to have that kind of more tactical knowledge uh, too. So it's challenging, um, but I think that students should always be provoked intellectually. And uh, I think that their learning should not be reduced to what is uh, kind of doable or uh, practically relevant. Now, in the spirit of a dialogical approach, um, I will, uh, I've probably said already too much, um, and I will stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Philip. So um, let's open up the discussion. I'm not sure, we, we seem to have lost Aoife, Henry, but uh, just because you're in Durham, you won't know where she's gone. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to bring in Jean-Pierre and Barry in, in the discussion too, and of course take some questions. Uh, already they're accumulating at the side of the uh, at the side of the screen, and in fact I'm going to 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 ask uh, Kadeja one of those questions. Well, first, but second, uh, I, I, I'll tell you what the question is, and then I'm going to ask a general question, and then I'll get you to answer that that initial question. So the question was um, directed to you from from Rowan, who asks, I thought this was very pertinent, um, as an international law student, I often wonder whether the dialogues we have in class um, ever make it into the practical sphere, so that by focusing on inclusivity and teaching, how likely is it we'll see a shift in cultural makeup and dialogues of practitioners? So this is, this is a question about how, 
readily these ideas of sort of cultural uh, attention uh, migrate out of the classroom. But I'm going to ask a general question before I turn to that specific question, Khadija. And the general question sort of builds from something Philip has been saying, namely the sorts of demands that come from students. So, so in a funny sort of way, our democratic move as teachers is also an anti-democratic move. We, we want to, to make ourselves in some ways or make the teaching experience less authoritarian by democratizing the classroom and bringing more students in. But in doing that, we're often not giving them what they want in the kind of consumer democracy sense. Uh, so I teach a course in international criminal law. At the end of the course, people say, you know, what happened to joint uh, what, 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 what to happen to joint criminal enterprise? Or why didn't we speak about the Tadic case? And why did we spend 10 of the 12 weeks on the Treaty of Versailles? You know, these sorts of questions. And I say, well, it doesn't really matter what particular part of history we looked at. The fact is we looked at it in great depth and I tried to bring together as many of the different themes and tensions and paradoxes in international criminal law as possible around that particular issue. Nevertheless, um, there are quite regularly, I wouldn't exactly put them in the complaints, but reservations about it, which go to the question of coverage. And I often think of someone like James Crawford here, who would be in here saying, you know, how exactly do we teach such a complex doctrine while also being super sensitive, while also managing to decenter ourselves and the discipline and decolonize the discipline. This is an extraordinarily difficult trick to perform. And all of you, I think, recognize that. But I'd just like to hear your comments on that, on that problem, if you like, before turning to the specific question that was asked of Khadija. So um, I'm throwing it open. Henry, I guess you started the, uh, the chat. So, so why don't you, you begin the, the Q&A session? Um, yeah, thanks, Kerry. That's a really easy place to <laughs> question to start with. Um, so to, to respond to what you're saying, I think that, um, oh, so personally, and I certainly not speak for Aoife, but I think that um, question of how to teach the, the, the subject and still do all these other things we'd like to do, um, I wonder if there is the uh, that's overcomplicating or being over reverent to the subject as isn't it you know there's more to be said for enabling the students to go further with stuff they're doing so certainly you know, our paper was starting from an undergraduate uh, optional public international law course which you're probably getting 150 200 students choosing to do um, so, you know, you're stuck with mass lectures to some extent, although you can do things on sort of flipped classrooms and stuff, but, um, you know, the, the, the limitations of that starting point. Um, I think then if you just sit, uh, if you just directed a kind of topic by topic traditional PIL course, that's much less engaging than trying to do something that speaks to the what the students bring with them into the into the classroom so they you know it, i i think the more politically satisfying or theoretically satisfying teaching can also just be better teaching i don't think they're conflicting perhaps at a higher level you might start thinking or with more of a in law school traditions that are more focused on training for practice then it, it perhaps becomes difficult um but certainly in our setting i think the it's engaging the student rather than drilling them through every different topic matter. But that's maybe what you were reflecting on with your own starting point. And now I've completely forgotten the question you asked uh, from the from the don't, audience. Don't worry about the question. I'm going, I'm going to put that to, to Khadija. In fact, I'm going to oh, put right. it to her now. Right. Uh, so so yeah, let, let's turn to that question. Then we'll come. We'll 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 pivot as people say nowadays back to the uh, back to the question that 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 Henry remembered he was answering uh, so Khadija, the, the question about the, the that was put to us by Rawan about the I, the idea of these dialogues maybe being successful in the classroom but less successful in the so-called outside world okay um, i would say thank you Rawan for this question um, I, and I, I can understand it for a law student 
it is it is an understandable question. Um, I I I don't want to portray a utopian world out there. I know there are still challenges when students graduate, but still I want the students to to look forward on how to handle all of this through the the framework of belonging. From my experience, I have I have experienced students who are giving up with many of the things that they hear or they see. So I, I don't want it to be a, a utopian world out there, but at the same time, I want the students to understand that they can do something about it when they go outside. And if we just make a small comparison from just our time now and what was there a few years ago, lots of changes ha have happened and change can still happen. We are living in a time of change. We're seeing it everywhere. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not something that is being in, in, in portrayed in the, in the classroom that we do belong. And for students, when they go outside, they will find, for example, no chances at all for working. Even the law education itself, it should, it, it, it should help students to work for their, uh, to, to, to the way it is, for example, curriculums, the way they are designed, many of them are designed in order to help students to find jobs outside when they, when they graduate. I'm aware of some universities, for example, who are really focusing on the, on the practice aspects of things um, and, the, and the legal skills required for that. So um, it is, it is, it is um, that's what I would say for Rowan. The other thing I would also take into consideration is that what's out there, which is not 100% as what everyone would like it to be, it is not, it, it, it would not be changed only by education, yes, but educating students towards going outside and, 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 and participating and try to achieve something something good for the change, that, that's what I, 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 I would think students should be uh, prepared for. It depends again on the course and the requirements of the course and the learning outcome, outcomes. I'm just speaking about basic international law courses, but they're, 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 there is a multi of them nowadays with all the diversity included in international law topics themselves. But um, that's what I would say. What's there, it is not, it, it will, the law will, teaching students, the law will help in the change. What is out there, it's not fully 100%. But still, it is all. It all should be done through this framework of belonging. We have to. We have to get this together. That's that's what that's my, that would be my answer for Ron. <laughs> yeah, great, great, thanks. So let me let me follow up on the uh, the, the the sort of Henry discussion then uh, about the the sort of relationship between these two democratic tendencies responding to somehow student consumers to use an awful term and trying to trying to make the classroom more democratic in, in Philip's sense. I, I mean, my view for what it's worth is that, that, that students of mine who go to the ICC will often say, I, I have to learn the Orich or Tadic case now while I'm sitting at my desk in order to respond to this question that my uh, the, 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 the deputy prosecutors put to me. And I say, that's great because there's no way you'd be reading Foucault there. So you had to do that back at the LSE. Uh, there's no point in me doing something that someone was, is going to do at The Hague anyway. I mean, that, that the point of education is to study things that you won't study again and to break the continuity between the workplace and the student experience and the spell of the, of the real world. But, I, but I'd really like to hear comments on this because you all touched on it in different ways. Aoife, what, what did you make of this? Well, I think also we may also need to think about, you know, what that real world is. I mean, for all of us, the real world is the academic world. And, you know, there's a huge amount of research about, you know, how authority occurs in international law, how international law is made and structured. And a lot of that is focused on how academics contribute, how the International Law Commission, which is mainly academics, um, if you look at the, you know, the judges at the ICC or the ICJ or ITLOS, a lot of them have practice and academic backgrounds mixed in. So I think there sometimes is a kind of, when we talk about what we're educating the students for, 
I think it does depend on who you're edging. And so if it's an undergraduate course, like a general one, or it's a postgraduate specialist one, you know, that does make a difference as to what the student's intentions is. So I do think in, in doing that, part of what myself and Henry were, were looking at was that ethics of getting them to think about where the law came from. You know, that a lot of it was people like, not like us, but what, because apparently in the 19th century would have looked a lot different. Uh, well, some of us would have looked a lot different. But it's a, is to think about that as well, that there is there is also that as practicing international law. It's the people who go on to do our jobs, that that's also part of it, and that we also have to think about them as teachers of international law, as practitioners of international law, as in writing things, whether it's writing briefs, or it's writing textbooks, or it's writing articles, or it's writing briefs for civil, for politicians if you go work in the civil service. That there's a lot of, you know, there's lots of ways in which how you construct a legal argument, how you think about a legal argument, that falls back on what we have done historically and that in talking to them about the ethics of who went before us so if, if we kind of stick to what myself and Henry were talking about in teaching the history of international law you know you tell them sure this is you know the great grandees of the 19th century but they were mainly working for governments they were writing these briefs for governments or just telling them you know Hugo Grotius wrote his big piece in order to help you know the the Dutch and their imperial adventures and to justify what they wanted to do you know, in that kind of way, you are also preparing people for what they will be doing in real life and asking them to think about it in an ethical way, to take that into consideration. So you're teaching them the bread and butter, but you're also teaching them about that wider, broader context and where they fit in that wider, broader context. And I think that's especially important for students who do not find in those uh, kind of hagiographical characters people who look like them, who come from the places they come from, be that a class-based, race-based, geographical-based, you know, they're not there. So they find it difficult to look at those characters and say, oh, that could be me. Because I would like my students to think of themselves as, as going potentially to do our kind of jobs. But especially for those students who don't find, there aren't people out there like them that they can identify with, that makes it particularly difficult. So I think all of those considerations have to come in, though I would also agree with Henry. I think the sort of idea that you, you know, you have to teach, like when I was teaching them the history and I started with Versailles, I taught them all, you know, states and all that came into it. It just, the center of that discussion was different. It is, I think it is perfectly possible. I don't think if, if we are too reverential for, I think that's what's happened to the textbooks. They've all felt like I have to say this, this and this or else I'm not a real textbook, as opposed to thinking, well, actually you could cover all those things in a, and take it from a different angle. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Um, I know Barry wants to come in and I do want to bring Nicola and Philip in. I'm gonna just read out a uh, part of Eric's question from the side as well, which touches exactly, precisely on this. Um, he asks, would this question be easier to answer if we establish what the learning objectives for the course are? If only I knew what the learning objectives of my course were. Um, but if the learning objective is for students to have a rough understanding of many issues under ICL, then it seems pedagogically we need to focus on that. If the learning objectives are to acquire skills, then we need to focus on that. So it may, it may depend to a certain extent on, 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 on that question, Barry. Yeah, thanks. I, I'll make this fairly quick because uh, I don't want to intervene too much in the discussion, but it's so fascinating. Um, I mean, I'm currently teaching at a liberal arts and sciences uh, school, so it's a bit different, but certainly, you know, thinking back to law school, uh, I do think, a, you know, a, a big part of law school is learning to kind of think like a lawyer. Um, and, and, you know, I do think students do expect that to a degree. Um, but I, I agree with what, what Aoife and Henry were saying. I don't think, you know, it's not an either or. I think you can you know, some of the best critical work can be done by understanding, by first understanding the ideology of legalism, as, you know, Judith, Judith Schlar would, would, would call it, right? I mean, if we can understand how lawyers think and how they work, then maybe even our critical edge and our critical capacities can be sharpened. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't want to say there's a balance to be struck, but I, I do think that it's not about it's not about letting go um, of you know, the doctrine main, mainstream approaches. Um, but it's about, you know, embedding those, um, contextualizing those, historicizing those, showing their biases, situating them. Um, yeah, uh, and so that's what I want to say. And, and just uh, very briefly, 
to uh, Aoife and Henry. Um, yeah, I just wonder how relevant, and I have no idea, right? I mean, but how relevant textbooks are uh, to, to, to the modern teacher of international law. Um, how I wonder how many, I, I mean, I don't know if anyone's done any work on this, but I wonder how, how much they use, because I mean, when I'm constructing my courses, I, I barely use them now. Um, you know, I, I try and find articles and uh, other things, edited volumes even. Um, so, so I think there's an interesting question there as well is, you know, how are, are they equipped for the modern Modern, modern conversations that, that we have in, in the classroom. Thanks. Yeah, while you're thinking of the answer to that question, Henry and Aoife, I do want to bring Nicola and, and, and Philip in. I mean, I, I just, I agree with that first point. I, I didn't really understand international legal doctrine until I started studying critical international law, or I began to understand why I didn't understand it might be a, another way of putting it. And I think that's perhaps what we can teach our students in international criminal law, just how much of the doctrine either doesn't really make sense or is riven with the sorts of tensions that people like Judith Sklar and Hannah Arendt told us about years and years ago. So I will come back to the textbooks question in a minute, but I, but I want to bring Nicola in here from Kigali and then Philip from Western Australia. Great, thanks Gary. Um, so, so I've got two answers to the question. The first builds very much on, on what's been said up to now in terms of it's what you're, it, in some ex, to some extent, how you are situating that doctrinal analysis. So, you know, you're reading a case, but you're reading next it next to an anthropological account of how private security, how, how private um, insurance agencies are actually doing a lot of the regulation of piracy, rather than how the, how a pirate's being prosecuted in Mombasa. So to some extent, we have we have a huge level of, of control. If we think about the anti-democratic parts of, of, um, of teaching, it's actually in the structure of the course, I think, as much as it is in the, in the actual delivery of it, that you craft how the students enter into that examination. Um, and so, so I think that gives us, um, I think that gives us quite, I think, I, th I think students often aren't as aware of that. Um, I think it took me being on the other side of the classroom to see how powerful it is to be able to have the control of uh, of creating the of creating the course. Um, but one of the things that I think mediates against that is a, is a is a growing practice of people sharing their syllabus, and I think that that's that's something that should be encouraged. And that and I think it also goes to my second point which is if we're talking about how we democratize the classroom, I think the biggest issue is about wider access to these debates. And it's come up in the, from Dr. Sawida in the, in the Q and A as well. It can't just be about, it can't, it can't only be about me engaging on international and transnational criminal law with the people who can afford mostly the 30,000 pounds it takes to do your LLM at King's. It has to be about how we start to make that more broadly accessible. Um, and so I think that's really pushing against the student client notion and trying to think about the routes through which we can make, um, we can make this, this knowledge more accessible. And I think that one one of the ways to do this, and I think Barry's actually been fantastic about this in the in the Twitter world, but sharing syllabus and, and encouraging people to engage with how we're how we're constructing these courses is both quite a, you know, it's quite a brave thing to do, um, but it's also, I think, a really important one. Great, thank you. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, thank you. Well, where to start? I'd just like to perhaps say a brief few words about the learning objectives and Eric, uh, Eric's question. Obviously, we want we need to be uh, clear about those, right? And uh, I, I just feel that uh, a lot can go into those objectives and where usually they are framed rather uh, vaguely. I think uh, often it is, you know, critical thinking, that's what we want to have those skills and you learn about international criminal law, international law, or whatever. I put in, you know, the context and uh, political and, and cultural and historical dimensions and whatever. Um, but as I said in my presentation, you know, the critical thinking, it can just mean a very different things to many people. That can be, you know, uh, let's critically examine uh, this uh, very doctrinal legal question, um, right? And, uh, and it's not the kind of critical thinking that other people would have in mind, um, I think. Um, and it goes back to this idea, as, uh, as Henry also said, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, engaging students and, and not drilling through kind of the doctrinal, all the relevant uh, or possibly relevant doctrinal questions. Um, but to encourage creative thinking and creativity. And I think that's really what is uh, what we need uh, 
um, in our world. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very mindful of the fact that I am directive in this thinking or as an educator in, in, in this sense, right? That's what I want to encourage. Like I have sort of an agenda here, but not in, not in a very prescriptive sense. So perhaps this also relates to, and I can briefly respond to a question that was also asked in the chat by, uh, by Elsena Jeffers, what about these, these real world solutions or how do you, do you, does anyone build sort of real world solutions or, or try to come up with those or simulate those in the, in the classroom? And I'm not very solution focused really. I'm not prescriptive as I said, I'm not solution focused. We, we do a really, I guess, more deconstruct and try to analyze and understand what's going on. Certainly think about uh, possible solutions, yes, but I don't think that's the, that's the main, uh, that's my main objective or that the classroom is sort of the main forum for this. Um, and it goes back to what Gary also said. I think what, what my main objective is really is to prepare students for whatever they will be doing afterwards, whether they work uh, at a court or whether they work for government or NGO, an NGO or whatever it is. Um, illegal practice doesn't matter, but I think um, they need, you know, certain, it, 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 it's really important to have an awareness of, you know, the, the, the broader context of the historical, cultural, and, and so on and so forth dimensions. Um, uh, be, uh, be aware of the ethical dimensions, as I've said, and Gary, as you said, you know, they, they will be able to uh, go through the kind of more legal or technical questions. Uh, they will have the skills to learn those quickly. They don't need to have learned all of that kind of specifically in the, in the, uh, in, 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 during the course, I think. Um, so it's really about encouraging this kind of creative thinking. Um, and uh, um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Perhaps a quick word, if I can, about the handbooks, just to pick up on that uh, conversation. Um, uh, Barry, you're entirely right. I don't think that handbooks um, are actually a, a, a most of the time sort of a, use, a useful uh, starting point. Um, I think that many students are still very used to that and like try like to kind of hold on to a book and say, well, this is sort of what I uh, what this is sort of what I really need to read. And of course, that's not a, a useful starting point either, because there is so much that they should be reading. There is this variety of voices. So I've edited this handbook kind of trying to combine these, these two ideas. Uh, you have a, hand, a book that you can hold on to, uh, but you have uh, in, this, in this book uh, 15 or 16 chapters with 16 different authors. And uh, in a way I could have tried to, you know, uh, of course find useful uh, articles, um, which I did not really uh, find that easily. And that's why I thought it would be nice to, to still have some, what is a bit of a coherent whole. It's not really that coherent at all because the voices are very different. Um, but uh, perhaps that's, it's, it's uh, sort of a, uh, an equivalent to some extent uh, to, to the uh, to well-selected um, academic articles, which I of course offer as additional readings too. That's Stop great. Here, so so I, I do want to take up this, uh, I mean, textbooks are not the most exciting subject, but it, but it does seem important for our purposes just to think about you know, how we might approach the textbook. I, I also want to remember Rob Cryer here, who died at the end of last year and who is a co-author of a very good textbook on international criminal law, really sad loss for the, for the community uh, and a good, good pal as well. So but, but Nicola uh, and then Khadija, can I bring you in on the, on the sort of textbooks issue, how you might use them, whether you use them, what you use instead? Great, Gary, do you want, what, do you want me to take that up first then? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, thanks. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so I mean this, on, on um, Rob Cryer and Daryl Robinson's um, textbook, that is actually the textbook I use for the course, um, but I use, for this particular one, but I use it in, in, as, a, as a point of reference that students can use if they want to make sure that they are, um, are clear on the doctrine. So I use it, I use it as a supplementary reading. And then, and then use a collection of articles um, as the core required readings for, for the text so that the students have quite a lot of, and, I, and I, I talked to them about this at the beginning of the course as well, that there's, you know, that, that the learning is, is on them, at least in part, um, to, to identify when they feel like they, they want to engage um, in a textbook that's going to guide them in a particular way of learning and, a um, and when they want to then relate that back to the broad, to the um, to the to the um, 
to the wider set of, of mostly article and book based um, readings that are set as the core. Um, but I then also do that in terms of how I teach the course. And again, you know, this isn't a model and, we're, and we all wrestle with this. Um, but the, I, I teach the course where I will start by laying out the doctrine and the core findings of some of the, of the, of the major um, cases and then go into how that then relates to the readings that the students have done for that, for that session. Um, so you're trying, you're trying to think about how you use that textbook rather than saying, um, text, you know, rather than saying a textbook is, is or is, is not crucial to, to how the course is taught. Yeah, great. Khadija. Um, I would say I'll do almost the same like Nicola. I will use the various of resources. Um, I, I know, I understand the students and they want to have this feeling that there is a book they are studying or something that they can always refer to. But um, multiple resources I would use. It depends as, again, also on the context and the language used for teaching. This is easily done when the language for teaching is English, but when it is Arabic, for example, there is a shortage here of uh, textbooks and um, and many of them do incorporate um, scenarios that I think not scenarios that do not work on 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 the on the belonging that have been spe speaking about the the belonging the, the belonging to a certain community um so finding a good textbook in arabic for example is a challenge um there are there some definitely but um it, it, to put to, to find good ones that's a challenge that's one point um and again there is the point of view of the students where you where, where you when, when you bring multiple resources for them, they learn they, to support your teaching and their learning. Again, um, the availability of the books themselves. Um, in some contexts, they might not be available. They're difficult to bring them into a place or another. So there are certain things also to be taken into consideration. Yeah, thank you. Great. So, uh, Aoife, uh, Henry, uh, possibly our last word on all of this now, it all seems to have passed far too quickly, but uh, any response on the, on the question of, of, the, of the textbook? Uh, and if you don't have a response on that, I have a completely fresh question about how you, how you approach the question of crisis that seems to be very important to international lawyers sometimes. I mean, do you teach? through crisis or do you reject it in the way that somebody like Hillary Charlesworth does as a way of avoiding some deeper structural or historical conditions in the discipline? So either that, which is, I know is a kind of three hour question uh, or, or the textbook question and we'll uh, begin to wrap up. Um, this is very quickly on the textbook, I think I think everyone's response is partially actually sort of what we were trying to drive at in doing the research because they don't speak to the students and it's it, a lot of them assume a very homogenous they imagine a very homogenous outcome to what the student wants and I think it, I mean we obviously only look at the history section but to me it didn't speak to them I think there's a broader issue with regard to textbooks and things like you know the writings of the greatest jurists of all time ever known to humanity etc and subsidiary sources of law and the role they play there and I think that's important on the issue of crisis it's interesting with because I, 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 I agree with, with Charlesworth's analysis on crisis but I think what you consider going further on what, what Charles is saying. So like in that example that when we used to the teaching, like we talked to them about say, like the anti-slavery move and slavery being a crisis and a crisis of international law. And that's, that's not, you know, that's not the invasion of Iraq and the bombing of Kosovo or, or the types of examples that, that Charles Smith was talking about. But say if, if you're teaching the history, like that, that was a massive crisis for a vast number of humanity that went on for hundreds of years. But that's not normally centered as a crisis. So in lots of ways, I think it's you can use crisis and flip it on its head and say, well, actually, you know, this was a crisis. You know, when the catastrophe of when Europe arrived and three quarters of the population died, that was a crisis. So I think it, in ways you can use the 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 
language of crisis to recenter them, to, to, to make it more relevant to the students maybe you're talking to and to ask them, you know, what's the quotidian crisis that people actually live through that international law very rarely ever focuses on. And I think that's in line with what with what Charlesworth was arguing as well about the role that the crisis that crisis uses. So I'll pass on to Henry. Great. So Henry, quick yeah, I say so with so to some extent I agree with you, Barry, on like whether textbooks remain relevant or whether and, and so for us writing the article are they a suitable stand-in or sort of synecdoche for, for for teaching uh maybe not because i've got all sorts of friends and colleagues who teach international law in interesting and brilliant ways so to say that the textbook doesn't do a good job of it is not to say that this teaching isn't happening but the circulation of these textbooks is still in the tens of thousands you know it's, it's still global is in they're all in their ninth or tenth editions they're doing you know they still stand for something they still represent something about the the, the how we tell uh, maybe how we tell non-international lawyers international law is and works um so i think that they're still worth looking at um i'm not sure i've got anything hugely useful to say on crisis other than when going back and reading sort of yourself and others uh gary writing in the late 90s on on teaching international law there's a lot of this theme of sort of crisis of post-cold war crisis of this loss of things of an alternative um, and maybe that crisis hasn't ended it was re sort of seen again with the with the financial crisis and there's not a lot of that so again teaching in uh, in Western European universities certainly that global financial crisis has still that why the students come with this polygonal change in in what they think about the world and what and the way they understand the world um, but so I think that kind of teaching through that idea of crisis as a lens limits things to events and loses the, the continuity of stuff, but, but being receptive to the fact that our, you know, a, a 19, 20 year old now lives in a world of complete catastrophe or thinks they're heading into a world of complete catastrophe in a way that I think marks them as distinctively different to maybe us teaching them. Yeah, great, great. Um, there's a really long question actually just arrived, which I have no intention of either answering or putting to the uh, putting to the panel from Pascal McDougall. But it's a very interesting question about the relationship between contingency and necessity. It's just a pity it came in at nine minutes past three, and we're due to finish at quarter past three because it really deserves a whole a whole seminar, possibly a whole workshop series to itself, Barry and uh, Jean Pierre. Anyway, just a suggestion. Thank you all very much, the panelists, Khadija, Philip, Aoife, Henry, and Nicola. It's been a very, very fruitful, illuminating discussion around these themes, and I, I look forward to a continuation of them. I'll, I'll, hand, I'll hand us back over to our dear leaders up there, Barry and, uh, and Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, um, just to say thank you to everyone for such a rich discussion. Uh, really amazing. Got a, I, I personally got a lot out of it. I'm sure everyone in attendance did. Um, Jean-Pierre? Yeah, um, just thank you very much to um, all the speakers, um, both from this panel and the panel earlier today. Thank you very much to you, Gary, for, for your excellent sharing. Um, reminder to everyone that the next um, day of or the next two webinars in this series will be on Friday, the 12th of March, which is in three weeks. Um, so please um, do um, keep an eye out on the on your emails for the reminders for that, but also please do join the conversation either via Twitter or via email. Um, and I'm sure most of the speakers or all of the speakers would be happy to continue this conversation um, by email. So thank you very much. Um, thank you again to the events team at, at Bickel and to Liam who is behind the Bickle logo without whom this wouldn't have happened. Um, other than that, thank you very much, everyone, and have a good weekend. Thanks very much.